Welcome back, fellow football fanatics. It's your host, College Football with Sam. And this is the month of November, or 10, or if you've played in week zero, 11 weeks into the pool, or the ocean, rather. That's how deep college football is. The ocean that is the college football season. And November is the month where you can't fake it until you make it. Either you've already made it, you found a formula to win if you're a team that has faked it until you've made it. Or you started out strong and you're finishing strong and you are peaking right now. Or you're a fraud and you haven't been discovered yet. This is the month where champions are bred, where iron sharpens iron, where Good teams in battling against each other either cripple their opponent or sharpen them for greater things to come. And this Saturday at noon, with Gus Johnson and Joel Klatt wearing their headsets in the booth, calling a wonderful game, James Franklin on the sidelines in a game where, as much as we've been talking about how this is a prove-it game for Michigan, this is also a prove-it game for Penn State not just in regards to James Franklin and if he can beat top-tier competition, but also because outside of Ohio State, Penn State has had an extremely weak schedule, and we'll get into the schedules of both of these teams here in a few minutes. But before we dive any deeper, please hit that subscribe button, click the notification bell so that you can get notified when I do these extra previews for big games. Tomorrow I will be releasing a preview and prediction segment. This video, there will be no prediction, but what I'm trying to do here is give you information, give you my thoughts, my analysis, and let you make your own prediction down in the comments below. So if you want to do this, comment down below your initial prediction for this game. And then make another comment or edit your old comment at the end of this video telling me what you think your prediction is after you watch this content. Also, like this video. Please comment your thoughts down below. Commenting and liking helps this video get into the algorithm. And we're trying to reach 20,000 subscribers by the end of the 2023 college football season. Michigan, Penn State, they have massive fan bases, so if you know any Michigan or Penn State fans who want more college football voices to listen to, please send them this video via a link or sharing it otherwise. And lastly, if you want to support the channel, check out my Patreon page via the link in the description so that you can support the channel and your support's appreciated. Or if you want some bonus content as well, you can pay an extra 5 or $20 a month, depending on how extreme of a fan you want to be, and you can get insider access to my picks, and also potential power. And I guess where I will segue into talking about this game is talking about potential power. Potential power has been down for a week, and unfortunately it won't be up this week. And I really wanted it to be up this week to talk about Penn State and Michigan, so I could you know use potential power to give a prediction, but I can't. And that's okay. Potential power was around 50%, 55% in covering against the spread, and it was around 74%, 75% in terms of picking the correct money line. However, I'm optimizing it, automating it, so it can be easier on myself, and so I can also grade every FBS team, not just the Power 5, and using a wide variety of information to make it accurate. But two weeks ago, Two weeks ago, potential power had Michigan as the best team in all of college football. And I can't imagine potential power would change that in the span of two weeks. Michigan, after all, they, they had a bye, and then they dominated Purdue. It was a sub-bar performance by Michigan. I think we can all admit that, but they still dominated Purdue despite having some rusty moments. And Penn State has done similar things throughout the season. They're one of the highest scoring offenses and best scoring defenses in all of college football, and yet they've looked sluggish in many of their games. So you can have a dominant performance without playing 
your A-plus scheme. Michigan would have been favored about two weeks ago to beat Penn State neutral field by, I'm just going to put it in this way because I don't know if it would be different now. I can't imagine it would be very different. Multiple touchdowns. That's not even including matchups, schematic matchups, roster matchups, you know, comparing how Kalen King matches up with Roman Wilson or how Blake Corum and Zach Zinner and Trevor Keegan and Michigan's offensive line match up against Donnie Dennis Sutton, Chop Robinson, if he's healthy or if he isn't healthy, hopefully he is, and Hakeem Biaman, Curtis Jacobs, Abdul Carter, etc. It's not even comparing matchups, which I want potential power to do at some point, like having a set number or average for certain schemes to guess or to accurately predict how schematic matchups matter when it comes to points. But not taking that into account, nor home field advantage, Michigan, Penn State, potential power would have favored Michigan to win by multiple touchdowns. Now, potential power's been wrong. It's just a power ranking system, and Michigan hasn't been tested as much as Penn State. And I don't always agree with potential power. There are games where I've straight up disagreed. I think either they're way too high on one team, even though it is my own power ranking system, or I've thought something else. There's been other moments where I think one team is schematically puffed up, another's underrated. We saw that with Arkansas beating Florida, just as a small SEC example. Arkansas was underrated because they lost several close games. Florida was inflated by a win over Tennessee, even though Florida isn't a good football team, and they they lost 39-36 in overtime. But the numbers, as we'll show throughout this video, I do think favor Michigan. What favors Penn State's home field advantage, and typically home field advantage is closer to a field goal than not, in my mind. In my opinion, Beaver Stadium's home field advantage, even without a whiteout, is such that it's closer to a touchdown than a field goal. Penn State is one of the best home field advantages in all of college football. And this doesn't adjust for, you know, how good each team was in a given season in the same way that Penn State's record on the road against Michigan doesn't either. But when Michigan travels to Beaver Stadium and Penn State travels to the big house, there are lopsided results in favor of the home team. Penn State, you know, crushing Michigan, 42-13 to in 2017, beating Michigan 28-21 in 2019. Those were home games. Michigan lost to Penn State 27-17 during the COVID season. At that point, even though it was played at the Big House, that was closer to a neutral site game than not. You flip it the other way around, Michigan beat Penn State by more than four touchdowns. I forget the exact score in 2016. In 2015, Michigan won 28 to 16 at Beaver Stadium. They also won 21 to 17 at Beaver Stadium, but those were, you know, pretty close wins. Penn State was competitive. Meanwhile, other times Penn State has either blown Michigan out at Beaver Stadium or they got a big lead and then let Michigan kind of crawl back but fail to achieve a win like in 2019. Michigan in 2018 won 42 to 7 and last year Michigan at home won 41 to 17 so the home team in this series has a pretty significant advantage they really do and James Franklin has never won in a full big house it's very challenging for Jim Harbaugh to win in a full beaver stadium Jim Harbaugh he's only beaten Penn State in a whiteout once and that was 2015 losing the 17 and 19 games. And this game should be a whiteout. I do not want to distract from that either. This should be a whiteout game. It absolutely should. This should be prime time. If I could get this at 8 p.m., Gus Johnson, Joel Klatt, even though it would give my team, the Wolverines, a disadvantage, I would take it. I mean, this should be a night game. And speaking of which, here's another factor in this way too early preview that I can't give you a definite answer on. I can give you a confident answer. I'm confident that Jim Harbaugh will be on the sidelines coaching in this game because I think that even if the Big Ten tries to suspend him, Michigan will likely be able to successfully at least keep that at a safe distance and keep 
you know, punishments at a safe distance until the end of the season, but I can't guarantee you that. He could not be on the sidelines on Saturday, and maybe that makes a big difference, or maybe since Schroen Moore calls the plays on offense and Jesse Minner calls them on defense, maybe Jim Harbaugh not being there doesn't make that big of a difference. Who knows? But Michigan's 9-0 and right now. They're third in the college football playoff rankings. Penn State's 8-1. and They're 11th in the college football playoff rankings. These rankings will be null and void as of tomorrow, Tuesday at you know, 7, 7.15, 7.30 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, whenever the rankings are concluded after being released from you know ESPN and other sources and the College Football Playoff Committee. But they'll be pretty close to what they are right now. There were teams ahead of Penn State that lost, I think the only one being Oklahoma, so Penn State will reach into the top 10. I don't expect Michigan to move up from three unless they win this game. If they lose, Michigan will fall. Michigan, I could even see a scenario where they beat Penn State and they don't rise ahead of Ohio State and Georgia, even though I think it's more likely they'd rise to the number two spot. Probably won't take the number one spot unless they beat both Penn State and Ohio State. So college football playoff committee views Michigan really just because Michigan is undefeated and Penn State isn't as the better team. Penn State's only losses to an Ohio State team that right now is among college football's elite. That number 11 ranking for Penn State tells me they are not getting in the playoffs with an 11-1 and record. And by 11-1, and I don't mean regular season, I mean factoring in conference championship. Penn State has to reach Indianapolis, and they have to win in Indy. They have to be 12-1 and to have a shot to get in. I don't think Penn State can get in with an 11-1 and record. I think Michigan might have a chance to do so. I think Ohio State, out of all these three teams, has the best chance to get in with an 11-1 and record without you know, winning the division in the tiebreaker and going to Indianapolis just because of their brand, strength of schedule, and the fact that losing to Michigan on the road, they did that in 2021, and they lost to Michigan last year at home by over three touchdowns and snuck in. So I think Penn State, they need everything to go their way, not just this game, but they also need Northwestern, Illinois, and Iowa to step up and win more games to ensure that they win the tiebreaker, if that even matters, because first and foremost, they need to focus on winning this game. For Michigan, though, they're not guaranteed anything right now, not even if they win this matchup. Michigan, with the sign-stealing allegations and their weak strength of schedule, one loss, they might be out, unless, let's say, they lose to Maryland in a close game but then beat Ohio State and Penn State and also win in Indianapolis. Any of Michigan, Penn State, or Ohio State being 12-1, and even if they lose to a crappy team, very likely, unless all remains constant and no other upsets happen in any other conferences, they're probably getting into the college football playoff. I mentioned earlier in the video that this is a prove-it game for Penn State as much as it is for Michigan, and that might confuse some people because Penn State has played Ohio State. West Virginia is a decent team. Iowa is a winning record at 7-2. and two. What are you talking about, Sam? What do you mean it's a prove-it game for Penn State? They've played a tougher schedule than Michigan has. Well, I'll tell you why. You look at ESPN's efficiency metrics. Ohio State, Penn State's toughest opponent, is the third most efficient football team. Michigan's toughest opponent so far is Rutgers, who's a whole 40 spots below Ohio State in efficiency. It was an admirable effort from Greg Schiano to play Ohio State as closely as he did. 35-16 to 16 is a very deceitful score that doesn't indicate how the game went. That was a close game, a competitive game, for three quarters until Ohio State pulled away. But then you look deeper, and you take the average and the median of Michigan's opponents by efficiency and Penn State's opponents by efficiency per ESPN and their analytics— the average efficiency ranking of Michigan's opponents is 76. On average, well, there's also a third of a point, but we can ignore that because that's also the case for Penn State. On average, the average Michigan te um, team rather that Michigan has faced all season long 
is in the 76th place out of 131 or 33 FBS teams. They're in the bottom half, bottom 40-45% of all college football teams. That's the average opponent that Michigan has played. The average opponent that Penn State has played is only five spots better, 71 out of 133 teams. That's because Penn State, while facing West Virginia and Ohio State, who are better than the best team that Michigan's played by efficiency, they've also played Delaware, they've played UMass, they've played Northwestern. All of these teams are, safe to say, abysmal. UMass and Delaware are outside of the top 100. Delaware, I just put 133rd out of 133 because they're an FCS team. Northwestern, they're 94th. And then when you look at the median, it's a little more favorable to Penn State. The median opponent they faced, according to efficiency, is ranked 80th out of 133 for Michigan's 88th out of 133. So despite Penn State playing Ohio State, Michigan only playing a team in Rutgers who might be fortunate to be just inside of the top 25 at the end of the year, their strength of schedule is rather similar. It is. And Michigan, according to efficiency, is the most efficient team in college football, the best team in college football. Penn State's in the top five, right at that five spot. According to college football nerds, CFBN for short, they have an amazing channel. Michigan is ranked number one according to their power rankings. Penn State is 13th. Michigan's also number one according to S&P+. Penn State is fifth. The Vegas line is Michigan minus four and a half as of right now. Um, but according to ESPN's FPI, subtracting the larger value, that being Michigan is their number two, and then subtracting Penn State's value from theirs, Penn State's number four. Michigan's about 27 points, according to FPI. Penn State's 25. Home field advantage on average in college football is three. According to FPI, Penn State should be either favored very slightly or it should be a total pick em. Meanwhile, nearly a full touchdown is added on to that in favor of the Michigan Wolverines. And I, I don't know exactly what that means. I, I have an itching that that means Vegas is hedging their bets on Michigan winning this game. Right now, according to ActionNetwork.com, looking at Penn State and Ohio State, Last time I checked, initially when this spread came out, the Wolverines were favored by six and a half, quickly fell. Right now, this game is Michigan favored by four and a half, minus 200 money line. Exactly 60% of bets are on Michigan to cover the spread, 40% are on Penn State to cover. I'm just using the free edition of Action Network so I can't see where the money is, but I can see where the total number of public bets are. And when you go into their public betting section and you look at the money line and the percentage of bets there, last time I checked it wasn't available, 49% of bets are on Penn State money line, 51% are on Michigan. So this is a very um, split game in terms of who thinks who's going to win. I think that a lot of people look at this game, they see this is Beaver Stadium we're talking about, large home field advantage, almost everyone has seen highlights of the 2019 Michigan versus Penn State whiteout just because the false start, the unbelievable noise. Michigan and Penn State, analytically, Michigan's the better team. But last week, and we all know recency bias can be a thing, last week Penn State did play the better game. They've played the tougher schedule. It seems like they're gaining momentum heading into this matchup while Michigan had to shake off some rust against a Purdue team right now that's 2-7. and seven. And while Michigan and their football team seem like they're galvanized around this whole sign-stealing accusations, illegal sign-stealing, not legal sign-stealing, I want to make that um, clear there, it could also mentally wear on them, and it could really make them question how good of a team they actually are. So... There's a lot at stake here. There really is. Michigan has not lost a Big Ten game since they played top 10 Michigan State on the road in 2021. Penn State is their seven, I think they're seven and two against the spread. I think only not covering or failing to cover against Indiana and Ohio State 
and covering slash, you know, beating everyone else. So, and in Michigan, I think it's four, four, and one. They're closer to 500 when it comes to covering the spread. They were 0 and 3 to begin the season. The only Big Ten matchup where they didn't cover was Rutgers, where they split. There was no action there. They won by 24. The spread was 24 in favor of the Wolverines. And Michigan was favored by 32.5, 33.5 against Purdue. They only won by 28 due to a late touchdown. Those late touchdowns just kill, absolutely kill spreads. But that's why betting the spread, it's so hard to be, you know, above 55% because just those late touchdowns, all you need is one play for a whole seven points to be added, which is just, it's crazy. One more thing I want to add before we break down the individual teams and talk about them. College football nerds, they have a model, and their model's imperfect, like all models. Michigan is predicted to score about 30 points. Penn State's predicted to score about 19, so Michigan winning by double digits. And I believe, I believe this is neutral. This is neutral field, I believe. So Michigan would really just be winning by a touchdown probably in this projection, though. I could be wrong. Michigan's predicted to average around five yards per play, Penn State around four. Michigan's projected to pass for 10 yards per attempt, only rush for two yards per carry. Meanwhile, Penn State's projected to pass for six yards per attempt and three yards per carry, or rush for three yards per carry. This model, I think, along with probably my own in predicting this game, would be, I think, somewhat imperfect. And I say that because... Penn State's secondary is ridiculously good. I know that Michigan's had insane numbers passing through the air, and Penn State's secondary I don't think is as good as they were last year. Or more likely, they've had some pretty off games this season. It's always tough to play Ohio State on the road and face Marvin Harrison Jr., and Indiana took advantage of busted coverages several times. Also, Talia Tagovailoa did have a pretty successful day against their secondary, but He had no run game, and Penn State later in the matchup was able to take advantage of their one-dimensionality. But I don't think Michigan's passing for 10 yards per attempt on Penn State. I also don't think they're rushing for only 2 yards per carry on Penn State. I think that the truth will be somewhere more in the middle. I don't think Michigan will have that much success through the air against Penn State. Maybe they'll average 10 yards per pass attempt, but if they do, I imagine they're not going to be throwing it a ton. It'll probably be via play action off the run. Michigan's offensive line will be facing a Penn State D-line that I think has intentionally undersized defensive tackles and edge rushers because Penn State's built to beat Ohio State, I think, more than they are to beat Michigan. And you look at Penn State and the opponents they've played in the same way that Michigan hasn't played really competent quarterbacks. They've played pretty suspect quarterbacks all year. Keaton Hauser and Hudson Card, maybe maybe Bowling Green's quarterback or Gavin Wimsat was the best quarterbacks they've played all year. That's not very impressive, and it's concerning given their secondary play and allowing big plays at times. Penn State has played Iowa, who struggles offensively. Penn State has played Northwestern, who can't run the football. Illinois had injuries along their running back room, and their offensive line is awful at protection. Indiana can't run the football, and Maryland, Maryland's offensive line has been destroyed in the past four weeks. They're not the same team the Terrapins aren't compared to what they were in their first five games, though playing a rough schedule will do that to you. It it will break a team that is not mentally and physically tough. For Penn State, I think college football nerds model is more accurate on, I would expect Penn State to rush for two, three, four yards per carry on Michigan and pass for a little under six or around six, just given how Penn State's and Drew Aller are averaging six and a half, 6.6, 6.7 yards per pass attempt. And on the ground, they're averaging four, four and a half yards per carry. But Michigan will be one of the best defenses, best rushing defense, in fact, that they have faced all season long. So let me know what you think of the matchup between these two teams down in the comments section. I think there's more to learn when it comes to Michigan because I think we can see that Michigan, given their returning production, 
given their stat sheet, the analytics, and also given the talent they have, especially an experienced veteran five-star quarterback, not a new green five-star quarterback in Drew Aller, I think it's safe to say this Michigan team does have a higher ceiling. They have a better wide receiver room. They have one of the deepest tight end rooms in college football, though so does Penn State. And they have a near elite great offensive line that I think has an elite ceiling. Their defense has also been locked down all season long. They have that higher ceiling, I think, than Penn State. And I think it's safe to assume they might have a higher floor, but they haven't been tested as much. And Penn State, they've only played one really tough team, really great team. But you can't fault them for that because the Big Ten outside of Michigan, Penn State, and Ohio State is just dog poop. And Rutgers is above average, good. Maryland at this point might be trending toward dog poop. Nebraska and Minnesota at one moment look average. Next moment look like complete gutter trash. Nebraska at times looks like they're still stuck in the Mike Riley, Scott Frost era. Other times they look like one of college football's most physical teams. And P.J. Fleck, one moment his team looks like they did when they lost to Bowling Green. The other, they look like the team that beat Penn State in 2019 or competed with Ohio State in 2021. So you can't fault Penn State for only having one extremely tough game to play when they're only going to have two, one being this, and Ohio State and Michigan really only have two as well. Notre Dame isn't this amazing team. They have three losses. Wisconsin's five and four. And strength of schedule just is what it is. You just have to win your games. And Michigan and Penn State just have to win. This is a very intriguing game for Michigan. They have the best team in college football in terms of efficiency, execution, and dominance. I made a video talking about Oregon football last night. And I think it's Michigan and Oregon right now. At this very moment, who are the most dominant teams in all of college football? Oregon just played someone, a rival, on the road, a rival who can take advantage of Oregon's somewhat suspect pass defense, and Dan Lanning got in his own head a little too much, and they lost that game. But I think, you know, six or seven times out of ten, Oregon probably beats Washington. If they rematch, I would take Oregon right now. Um, Oregon is one of the most balanced teams in all of college football. They have an elite offense. The way they control games is just impressive. Michigan's number one in game control. They're number one in average in-game win probability. They're dominant. They execute well. Their run game, I think, is underrated due to the fact that Michigan's passing a ton this year. I think Michigan could run the football better if they wanted to. At the same time, their passing attack, I think, could be inflated. J.J. McCarthy barely has over 200 passing attempts. He's been spoon-fed throws and really all but two or three games against Purdue. He had 37 passing attempts against East Carolina. He had 30. And there have been other matchups where he has had to make some good throws or like against Nebraska. He's just made some risky decisions that paid off some really high level throws, but he's looked rusty at times as well. And Michigan receivers aren't Ohio state receivers and Michigan has great tight ends, potentially elite tight ends. They don't have a unicorn tight end like Georgia does in Brock Bowers. Hopefully he gets healthy and returns to the college football landscape. This team has an elite offense, an elite defense, and their passing attack definitely has a high upside to it, an elite ceiling with their tight ends and wide receivers. Roman Wilson on the season, he has 10 receiving touchdowns on 36 receptions, and he has 589 receiving yards. Roman Wilson is a great player. Cornelius Johnson has 422 receiving yards. Colston Loveland has 419. Michigan has 2,314 receiving yards on the season. They're averaging 13.2 yards per reception, and they have 20, 20 receiving touchdowns. Michigan barely had more than 20 receiving touchdowns last season, and that was in 14 games. Michigan's only played nine games so far this season, so Michigan obviously a team that wants to pass the football more. They have 233 pass attempts to 329 rushing attempts, so they're still running the football quite a bit, but not as often as they are last season. And some of that is due to the fact that Michigan's played so many fourth quarters where they are just pounding the rock. 
so they can chew clock and get their blowouts over with. I imagine against Penn State and Ohio State, the Wolverines might use a more use a more balanced attack. But we'll just have to wait and see. Michigan's rushing for 1,504 yards on the season. They're averaging 4.6 yards per carry. They have 25 rushing touchdowns. Blake Corum leads the team in rushing yards with 649. He's averaging 5.2 yards per carry, and he has 16 rushing touchdowns. Donovan Edwards has 232 rushing yards. He's averaging 3.1 yards per carry, and he has two rushing touchdowns. Edwards, through the air, has 225 receiving yards and is averaging 9.4 yards per reception. Right now, I think he's a much better receiver than he is a running back. I'm waiting to see if he ends up breaking out in either this game, maybe against Maryland like he did in 2021, or maybe against Ohio State like he did in 2022. I think that the minute Edwards gains confidence that he finds the right hole, he'll break loose or break through and get a touchdown. We just have to see if that is even going to happen this season. I'm kind of in a I'll believe it when I see it mood with Edwards, but we'll just have to, again, wait and see. The weaknesses of this team are very little, but they have allowed some big passing plays, which can be problematic. And this is to Gavin Wimsat, Ethan Kaliak Manis. This is to Indiana on a trick play. Two, I know this is late, it's nitpicking, but to Hudson Card, and it was Mike Sainer still on plenty of those plays that got torched. And I think that's because he's an aggressive player, he wants to be a playmaker, he's a great tackler, he's often used to get pressure on the court quarterback when you know Michigan sends a corner blitz. I think he's a great near-elite elite player, but I've noticed that him and Michigan secondary players, period, outside of Will Johnson, have had their not-so-fun moments when defending explosive pass plays. A lot of that's in garbage time, though, or maybe it's a one-time occurrence, so you can classify it as nitpicking, but I've mentioned this over and over and over again, and Drew Aller has a cannon of an arm and enough accuracy on the deep ball to where him and Lambert Smith can take advantage of that. Michigan's number one in points-per-play margin with a 0.522 points-per-play margin. That's by quite a significant margin, along with their yards per point margin at 24.4, number one in the country. Their dominance, you can't question it. Points per play, Michigan has, they score 0.639 points per play. That is nuts. That's like up there with USC, Oregon, Washington, what Ohio State did for the previous two seasons. This offense is great. And pick sixes are included in this as well. Michigan's defense has four pick sixes on the season for defensive touchdowns, and they're good at forcing turnovers. Michigan's 11th in yards per play, so there's that explosive offense. 6.7 yards per play is pretty impressive. In defending the run, Michigan's allowing 3.1 yards per carry. However, I will say, in the same way that I think Michigan's secondary might be more vulnerable than statistically advertised, I think Michigan's run defense is better than statistically advertised. Michigan against Purdue, against UNLV, and against Bowling Green in the fourth quarter allowed opponents to run on them when they played their second stringers and backup defense. Same with Nebraska when Joshua Fleeks took off for that 74-yard run. At the same time, Michigan and their secondary, I think if they face a more competent quarterback, and Aller will be the best quarterback they've faced all season, if they get his average or above-average game, if Aller plays at a below average or bad level relative to what he's done this season, Aller has been pretty bad at times. He's been pretty off kilter. So it'll depend on what version Michigan gets of him. But watch for those numbers. I wouldn't be shocked if Michigan in yards per carry allowed stays the same or decreases, and their passer rating in a bad way it allowed increases. From opponent points per play, Michigan is first by a significant margin, only allowing 0.117 points per play. They're very good at keeping teams out of the red zone. They haven't allowed a first and goal yet all season long, which is just, it's nuts. That's totally nuts. I don't think they've allowed a first and goal all season long. Correct me if I'm wrong, but we're nine games in. This is one of the best, if not the best defense in the country, and they're allowing 4.1 yards per play, which is fourth nationally. Now let's talk about Penn State. 
Penn State Nittany Lions, they have an opportunity on their hands. James Franklin only has one regular season top 10 win. That came at home in a night game against an Ohio State team that Ohio State fans would say was one of the lesser Ohio State teams of the past decade. In 2016, Ohio State underperformed having you know, Curtis Samuel and having JT Barrett. And I forget his name, but they had an All-American center as well. I mean, Ohio State had players. They had talent. That was when Ed Warner, former Michigan O-line coach, was Ohio State's OC. And Ohio State fans were driven nuts by his play calling. Um, I digress. Penn State that season was magical. They were insanely clutch. Two of their three top 10 wins under Franklin came in that season, where Penn State at the end of the year wasn't that statistically impressive. Um, a lot of that was due to the fact that their defense allowed a ton of points to Pittsburgh, who had an elite offense, to Michigan, who had a great offense, and to USC, who had a near elite offense. Penn State was 21st in points per game that season, 47th in opposing points per game, yet they were 8th according to the simple ranking system, and they were 11-3, and three, just a few plays away, perhaps, from winning you know, two of those three losses. It was a very clutch, finesse, tough, persistent Penn State team. We haven't seen that same mentality amongst many of these Penn State teams, at least in moments where it matters. We've seen it last year in November after they lost to Michigan and OSU, and they looked like one of the best teams in all of college football, but they lost their two biggest games, and barring a miracle, they were locked out from even being considered to play in Indianapolis. We've seen it with Penn State at times in 2019 when they were just they physically pounded you. Then the Minnesota upset happened, and then Ohio State physically pounded Penn State. And in 2017, I think Franklin had his most talented team, a more talented team with Barkley and Gesicki and McSorley, an even more talented team than this year's. And they lost two games by a combined four points. Similar story to 2016 Michigan, just two seasons that are full of what-ifs. I think 16 Michigan and 17 Penn State, here's something that Michigan and Penn State have had in common. They had better teams than Ohio State for years, or at times, but Ohio State had them much better and much more dedicated and football IQ head coach in Urban Meyer, and he was able to compensate for his team's, I think, lacking of whether it's talent, physicality, development, whatever you want to call it. I think that 16 Michigan was better than 16 OSU, and 17 Penn State was better than 17 OSU, but both those teams had to play on the road. They weren't as clutch as Urban Meyer or Ohio State. Therefore, Urban went 2-0 and against the 16 and 17 teams that had to play in his house, and I think were better than his overall. That doesn't pertain much to this video other than saying that James Franklin just, he's like Jim Harbaugh pre, whether you want to call it pre-2021 change or pre-sign stealing or somewhere in the middle where Jim Harbaugh changed as a coach, but sign stealing helped him. James Franklin's a lot like Jim Harbaugh circa 2015 to 2020, where he just couldn't win a big game for the life of him. Now, at the same time, as I've said in comments, I don't think it's fair to take all of Jim Harbaugh's wins or big wins away from the past two seasons, but you do have to wonder if things would have been differently. You have to wonder, it's very likely the case, that some games that were W's could have and would have turned into L's if he didn't have a legal access to sign stealing. You have to at least wonder that. If you don't want to consider that, at least, well, if you don't, think it's true, at least consider it's true. Consider that to be the fact. But Franklin has home field advantage. This Penn State team, I think, is peaking. When you look at their defense, they're only allowing 1.8 yards per carry. Now, that's sack-adjusted. Penn State, with the amount of sacks they get, is going to be inflated in that statistic, and they haven't faced too many rushing offenses that are you know, competent, but it's still, it's extremely impressive. This, I can tell you for a fact, this is a much better run defense than last year's 
run defense. Now, does that mean Michigan will run for 50 yards and average 1.5 yards per carry? I don't know about that, but we'll have to see. It's a possibility, given how Michigan's rushing attack at times has looked lethargic. Much like Penn State's offense, though. We'll get to that in a few seconds. Defensively, Penn State is first in yards per play, allowing 3.8. They're fourth in opponent points per play allowed, with 0.193 points allowed per play. And they're ninth in defensive passing efficiency allowed, allowing a 109.24 passer rating. Again, though, they faced Kyle McCord and Marvin Harrison Jr. They faced better passing offenses. This includes Garrett Green in West Virginia and even Luke Altmaier in Illinois. Luke Altmaier is one of the better quarterbacks. Same with Northwestern's quarterbacks, whether that's a Ben Bryant or Brendan Sullivan. Those are some of the better quarterbacks in the West. So at the same time that Michigan's faced better run offenses, Penn State has faced better passing offenses. Again, I'm very curious to see after this game who we consider to have the better defense. I, I'm very, that is an area that I am fascinated in. I think if Penn State wants to win, they have to have the better defense. And I will give Penn State this. They right now... They have almost identical defensive statistics if you take the four stats that I've showed you on the screen all into equal consideration. They have pretty darn near equal defenses, and Penn State has played a great offense or a good offense in Ohio State. Michigan, best offense they've played, it's just kind of you know, funny considering it's probably Rutgers, because Rutgers has a near elite rushing offense. They just have a very poor passing attack. So if Penn State, I think, wants to win this game, they have to have the better defense. Michigan, they can't make mistakes because Penn State is the team that forces more turnovers and doesn't give up as many turnovers. Penn State is better at taking care of the football, and they have better special teams play than Michigan. So Michigan, you can't make mistakes. I think that's the biggest key for them is do not turn it over. Do not give Penn State a short field. For Penn State, not only force turnovers, which you know would help imply they have a better defense, but you have to be stout defensively because this Michigan team is more efficient at scoring points, and they have a much more explosive offense than you do. Penn State is 91st, 91st in yards per play. Now, it helps that they've converted nearly 15 fourth downs. Uh, their quarterback sneak with their you know big offensive line is one of the biggest in the country and a quarterback in Drew Aller who honestly could function as a power back or a fullback in short yardage, their quarterback sneak is unstoppable. Their problem is when they have probably more, they're probably more effective at running the quarterback sneak than they are at running in the shotgun because they struggle to open up holes in the run game. Really, to me, Penn State is three yards and a cloud of dust in the run game. The problem is, Passing the football, they're not that much better. I mean, Drew Aller this season, 6.6 .6 yards per pass attempt, completing 62% of his passes, 20 passing touchdowns, one interception, a 140.3 passer rating. The secret to his success is half of his passing touchdowns are two tight ends, Theo Johnson and Tyler Warren, who have nearly 500 receiving yards, they have 47 receptions, and they're averaging around 10 yards per reception. Overall, Penn State's receivers are averaging 10.5 yards per reception. They have 1,987 receiving yards, and Penn State has 1,559 rushing yards, which is actually more than Michigan's. Penn State has had nearly 50. They have 45 more carries to be exact. They're averaging 4.2 yards per carry, and they have 20. They have 20 rushing touchdowns. So these offenses, I think that the defense, we have to you know wait and see which is better. I would give Michigan the edge on offense, even if you adjust for schedule. Uh, you don't go from 91st to 11th, adjusting for the schedule that these two have in terms of yards per play. And I think Penn State fans know this, also looking at, you know, pass completion. Uh, from what we know, J.J. McCarthy is perhaps, I, I would argue, a significantly better quarterback than Aller, and I can tell you that right now. 
Um, tight end, close. Running back room, close. I think Corum's the best back, but right now Singleton and Allen are both doing better than Donovan Edwards. Penn State's offensive line is built for, I would say, a different purpose, more of a power-oriented performance, while Michigan's offensive line, I think, is more like a Swiss army knife in its approach. I think better at pass block and probably better at other things as well. I'd say, like, opening up holes for longer runs, but for straight up, like, overall power, gaining that one or two yards, I think Penn State's might have an edge. Defensively, both teams, there's just so much to be unpacked. And looking at the opponents that they faced, I think this game will determine really who has the better defense. And I think that'll determine who wins this matchup. Penn State thrives off their elite defense. They avoid turnovers. They have an elite defense overall, much like Michigan. Their offense is disciplined. I would say more disciplined than Michigan's. And they have much better special teams play than the Wolverines do. The Wolverines are 115th in special teams efficiency. They are. Uh, they're first in defensive efficiency and second in offensive efficiency, according to ESPN. And overall, they have a 95.7 efficiency metric, which is six points ahead of Oregon, who's at number two. Penn State is fifth in overall efficiency, 24th for offensive efficiency, second for defensive efficiency, but fifth, fifth for special teams efficiency. So disciplined, Solid special teams, great defense, elite defense. This Penn State team reminds me of a much better or a superior, I, I don't know if I'd go as far to say as much better. If they win on Saturday, that'll be the case. From what we know right now, Penn State is a better addition of 2021 Iowa. Elite special teams, elite defense, an offense that Iowa's in 2021 at Tyler Goodson, they like to run the ball more than pass, and occasionally via play action, and Petrus, who had just a monster arm, they could hurl it deep and get an explosive play out of you. Um, that's what we know right now about Penn State. Michigan, I'd say right now, it, it's hard for me to make a comparison. It really is. I think the Wolverines, in one way, you could say they resemble the Georgia teams of the past two seasons but that might be taking it too far. Again, that's just what we have seen right now. In another sense, you could say that Michigan right now looks like the past two years of just their own team with a better passing offense. I think Michigan, it's harder to put them in a box right now because I think they have that higher ceiling, but we haven't seen them play in a big game yet. We've seen Penn State play in a big game. We have a better idea of who Penn State is. Michigan is more intriguing Right now, they look like the better team, but the better team doesn't always win. And Beaver Stadium, I'm telling you as a Michigan fan, elite environment. That environment could totally change the game. It could. I mean, Michigan could beat Penn State by 35 on a neutral site. Part of me wouldn't even be surprised and lose by 14 in Beaver Stadium. I mean, Beaver Stadium, I'm telling you here now, this is the end of the video, so I feel like I can say this after I've said all the facts from my perspective, I would pick Michigan and say it's almost a, you know, matchup-wise, it looks like a very likely Michigan win if Michigan played neutral field or in Ann Arbor. But Beaver Stadium makes a massive difference, and that's where you'll have to wait until my preview video tomorrow to see what I have to think. Think of a crash, 2488, Anthony McDowell, Justin Rudge, Spencer Bringhurst, Noah DDLC, SFS Inverted, Will Loftus, Gabriel Callender, Roaming Gnome, Matthew Sale, Chris Lane, Austin Christmas, and Zubin Za for being Patreon sponsors. Have a phenomenal day, guys, and I will see you all around. Bye-bye.